The man known to history as Robert Edward Lee was born on the 19th of January 1807 in Stratford Hall, Virginia. His father was Henry Lee III who was born into a privileged family and was also a famous American Revolutionary War hero. Henry Lee grew up in one of the foremost families in Virginia as his mother, Lucy Grimes, was once courted by George Washington while his father, Henry Lee II, bred horses. When Henry III turned 14, he attended Princeton with other founding fathers like Aaron Burr and James Madison standing out amongst his peers. It was during this time that Henry Lee became wrapped up in revolutionary sentiment and joined the Continental Army. He climbed through the ranks and earned the nickname Light Horse Harry, following the cavalry charge he led at the Battle of Paulus Hook, New Jersey, which drew the attention of George Washington. Following the war, he served as the governor of Virginia. Robert E. Lee's mother was Anne Hill Carter, who was born into a prestigious and wealthy plantation family. Anne's father, Charles Carter, was a fifth generation plantation owner of the Shirley Plantation. Anne Carter married Henry Lee III during his governorship on the 18th of June, 1793, in the governor's mansion parlor room. Following his retirement from the governorship, Anne moved in with Henry Lee at the family's holdings. Together, the couple had a total of six children, but only five survived into adulthood, with Robert E. Lee being the fifth child born. When Robert E. Lee was only one, the family fell on hard times, as the main source of income, the Stratford Plantation, was taken via entail and given to Henry's son from his first marriage, Henry Lee IV. The lost revenue was just one financial disaster that fell upon the family as Henry Lee had terrible luck in land speculation and ended up in debtor's jail twice. While protecting one of his friends who opposed the War of 1812, Henry Lee was injured severely and left the family to recover. Robert E. Lee would not see his father again as he died on the 25th of March 1818 on Cumberland Island, Georgia, whilst trying to reunite with his family. Ultimately, Robert's father became known simply as the man who wrote Washington a bad check. Lee spent his time with his widowed mother in a modest home, though this was only possible due to the Carters leaving a small legacy to sustain her. The family lived at the Ravensworth Plantation, which was owned by one of Anne's relatives, William Henry Fitzhugh. Ravensworth Plantation would serve as the backdrop for Lee's depressing childhood, as the house was on the outskirts of Alexandria, in the swampy, mosquito-infested and unhealthy part of town. The house's interior was never painted while the Lees resided there, and they did not live alone, as they frequently shared with boarders. Lee did not live a privileged childhood, but he had fond memories of his pet lobster and hummingbird, which began his love of animals, yet they sadly both passed on the same day. Lee spent his summers swimming in the Potomac and playing in the local springs, he attended a plantation school in Fouquier County before attending the Alexandria Academy at the age of 14. He received an excellent education whilst attending the Alexandria Academy, learning literature, algebra, as well as the classics. Lee's family was well connected to the Virginia aristocracy. This led to Fitzhugh penning a letter to United States Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, imploring that he allow Lee a spot at the United States Military Academy, West Point. Fitzhugh had Lee deliver the letter personally to Calhoun, which resulted in Lee being enrolled at West Point in 1825. For all of Lee's life, he had lived in the world of slavery, and now that he would be attending West Point, he would be entering a world where slavery was all but extinct. But despite the Lee's financial situation, they maintained four slaves left to Anne by her father. Lee was accustomed to being surrounded by slaves, but as he went further north, the number of enslaved blacks lessened. And whilst they were still not equal, many held freedoms Lee was not accustomed to. West Point at the time focused heavily on engineering, thanks to its superintendent, Brevet Major Sylvanus Thayer. Before Thayer had arrived at West Point, it was marred with drunkenness, disorder, and riots, but he transformed the academy into a prestigious institution. He introduced the famed cadet uniform, with grey coats, starched white trousers, and plumed black leather hats with polished brass scales for the chin straps. When Lee arrived in June of 1825, there were roughly 200 cadets who would be given an exam intended to weed out those who were idiots and misfits. 
Following that, the cadets who made it through the examination were paired with three other cadets who shared a tent. Together, the tent mates had to purchase a joint toilet, a looking glass, a washstand and a basin, pitcher, tin pail, broom and a scrubbing brush. The quality of the food was often described as poor, yet Lee never complained about it. Wealthier cadets who snuck out of West Point would visit Gridley's Tavern to eat, drink and smoke. Most who went out would be given a demerit. But Lee never received any demerits, accomplishing a feat few others achieved. The curriculum consisted heavily of mathematics and French, as mathematics was crucial for military officers of the era, whilst France was the only ally to the United States and most military textbooks were in French. The Marquis de Lafayette often visited West Point to inspect the cadets, and these visits inspired Lee as Lafayette and his father Henry had fought together in the American Revolution, bringing 18th century heroes into evolving 19th century military tactics. Lee's daily regime at West Point started at 5.30 a.m. with the Revali, following a full day of mathematics and French classes, along with hours of independent studies, the cadets finished their day with full dress drills, parade and inspections. The cadets' day would officially end at 10 p.m. and whilst all cadets maintained a busy schedule, Lee made many friends during his time at West Point. One such friend was troublemaking third-year cadet Jefferson Davis, who was caught going off grounds to the local tavern to get drunk. He was only allowed to remain due to his previous good standing. When Lee's first year at West Point finished, he was third in his class and achieved a rating of 285 and a quarter out of 300 total points available. He was placed on a list with the other distinguished cadets, and Lee's status among the good and the great was odd for a man new to the academy. His reputation would earn him the nickname Marble Man for his emotionless expressions whether he won or lost. During Lee's second year, drawing was included in the curriculum, as officers were expected to be able to draw a usable map. Lee was made a senior cadet and tutored many of his fellow cadets in mathematics. He was enamored by the campaigns of Napoleon Bonaparte and read multiple books about his campaigns. Many of these books were new to the United States, showing the impressive collection West Point had. Also, Lee's ability to read French with relative ease allowed him access to these texts, as they would not have been translated into English. Many of Napoleon's tactics would be used by Lee on the battlefield, as, like Napoleon, he refused to fight on the defensive and preferred to use rapid attacks and bold flanking maneuvers. Following Lee's second year, he maintained second place standing in his class and applied for leave to visit his mother who now lived with Lee's oldest brother, Charles Carter Lee, in Georgetown. His mother's health had greatly deteriorated since Lee went away to West Point, and when he came home, he took control of her care. Lee returned in 1827 for his third year at West Point and added physics and chemistry to his course list. Lee was introduced to battalion tactics and artillery use on the battlefield. He enhanced his knowledge by reading Machiavelli, Hamilton, Rousseau, and John Paul Jones. His wide command of different subjects outside of the military or engineering made him a special officer, though he remained in second place in his class. When Lee started his final year, he was given the position of adjutant of the corps, which is the highest position a cadet can hold. He would take his final exam on the 1st of June, 1828, finishing second once again, only to Charles Mason. Upon graduating, Lee was given his choice of commission as a lieutenant in the Engineer Corps, a prize worthy of a top student at West Point. Though his achievements while at West Point would bring joy to Lee for a time, another family hardship would hit him hard. Lee had just arrived home when it became clear his mother would not recover, and in a couple of weeks of his return home, Anne passed away. Following his mother's death, Lee spent much of his time in Arlington, Virginia, especially with Mary Anna Randolph Curtis. The two met during Lee's first furlough, and he made a good first impression whilst attending house parties in his grey cadet attire. Ironically, they were seen as a mismatched pairing, as Lee was never late and was overly organised, while Mary was almost always late and scatterbrained. Despite this, the two took their time with supervised visits and hoped eventually for a future together with the blessing of Mary's parents. 
On the 11th of August, 1829, Lee received orders from Washington to report to Major Samuel Babcock of the Corps of Engineers in Cockspur Island, Georgia. Unfortunately for Lee, Cockspur Island was a depressing, hostile location with heat, humidity, fever, and mosquitoes, which made summer work unbearable. But it was also near where his father was buried. The Corps of Engineers had been attempting to build a fort to protect the mouth of the Savannah River, but was struggling to succeed. Lee immediately got to work, even getting involved in the labor himself, although most of his work would be destroyed by a storm after the labor season ended. Major Babcock would not return to Cogspur, as he was replaced with Lieutenant J.K.F. Mansfield. Mansfield lacked confidence to complete the project, and in turn would be replaced with Captain Delafield. Lee and Delafield immediately began outlining new plans for the fort with Lee acting as the draftsman. Savannah would teach Lee a valuable lesson with regards to the sedated decision-making of the Corps of Engineers and how projects lacked sufficient funds and were located in the worst places possible. He felt that if a situation was hopeless to change, you should remove yourself from the situation and so Lee used his connections in Washington to get him reassigned to Old Point, Virginia, at Fort Monroe. Transferring to Fort Monroe would bring him closer to Mary, and his smart decision-making would set him apart from others. On his way to Fort Monroe, Lee stopped in Arlington to see Mary, and whilst there, he finally convinced her father to let them marry. Mary took Lee to the dining room to eat, and Lee asked Mary if she would marry him. The couple would marry on the 30th of June, 1831, and Mary decided to share Lee's quarters at Fort Monroe. She did so, and they lived there completely on their own, without any support from her father. The two were quite unique, as Mary had a tendency to boss Lee around the house, something unusual in the era. Nonetheless, the two maintained a strong bond, and it was during this time that the Lees acquired a place in Arlington, a location which enabled him to put down roots, something he never had during his childhood. The Arlington House, as it would be later called, was heavily inspired by Lee's relative's house, Mount Vernon, or George Washington's plantation. The couple moved into Lee's quarters at Fort Monroe in August of 1831, but his ability to work would be affected by problems with the authority of the garrison, between the fort and school leader, Brevet Colonel Eustace, and the engineer leader, Captain Andrew Tolcott. Disputes rose frequently between the two men, mainly because the laborers for the engineering corps were disruptive to military procedures, which vexed Brevet Colonel Eustace. Despite the conflict between the army and the engineers, Lee excelled and took on vast amounts of responsibility, despite his inferior rank to many other officers. Lee worked hard to complete Fort Monroe, which would become known as the Gibraltar of Chesapeake Bay and it was during this time at Fort Monroe that America's only effective slave revolt occurred in Southampton County, Virginia, which became known as the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner was an educated slave who preached to other slaves about the evils of slavery and how one day God would release them from their chains, allowing them to enact their revenge against their owners. An eclipse gave Turner the sign he was looking for, and he started his rebellion on the 21st of August, 1831. As a result of the rebellion, Fort Monroe received three companies of artillery to deter any further rebellions. This event would shock the South as the myth of happy slaves was ultimately laid to rest. It also resulted in stricter laws regarding the freedom of slaves. Robert E. Lee was always consistent regarding his view on slavery and its effects on society. He was never an enthusiastic supporter, and in a letter to Mary, he stated that, quote, Slavery as an institution is a moral and political evil in any country. It is useless to expatiate on its disadvantages. I think it, however, a greater evil to the white man than to the black race. And while my feelings are strongly enlisted on behalf of the latter, my sympathies are more strong for the former. Although Lee expressed disapproval of the institution of slavery, he still held the common view in the latter half of his letter that, quote, the blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race, and I hope will prepare and lead them to better things. 
how long their subjugation may be necessary is known and ordered by a wise and merciful providence. Lee held a young moderate southern gentleman's view on slavery. While he agreed that slavery was immoral, he believed that the problem of slavery would be handled by God in his time, and it was not the responsibility of politicians or slave owners to answer the question. While Lee's approach was more of inaction towards the institution, despite his objection to it, others would take a different approach. Henry Clay, John Randolph, and Richard Bland founded the American Colonization Society to sponsor the creation of Liberia to send free blacks back to Africa. In order to satisfy slave owners, they were to be compensated for the loss of their slaves. Ultimately, the Liberia plan failed in its initial goal and as tensions rose, it was written off as a slaveholder's scheme. The politics at Fort Monroe continued, and despite Lee's low rank, he always seemed to have more influence than senior officers, such as Colonel Eustace. This is believed to be because General Gratio, the chief of the Corps of Engineers, had more political sway in Washington, D.C. over the chief of artillery. Lee would lead the project to extend and reinforce a 15-acre artificial island, which would eventually become Fort Wool. This new fort would be used to support and defend Fort Monroe with crossfire at enemy vessels. Though the work was steady, he gained no joy from it and began to doubt his choice to join the military. The new soldiers who arrived at Fort Monroe brought new social life, primarily in the form of drinking, although Lee would abstain for the most part and never understood the obsession with getting drunk. Unlike many of his fellow young officers, he was never seen as being stuffy and was considered to be great company to be around. He kept his distance from his peers and was a reserved man. Mary would visit Lee at Fort Monroe in June of 1832, and it would be during this time that the couple would announce the impending arrival of their first child. The Lee's first child would be George Washington Custis Lee, who was named after his grandfather, George Washington's adopted son. Mary would spend much of her time raising him at Arlington. Between 1832 and 1834, Lee would essentially take charge of the engineers at Fort Monroe from his friend and superior, Captain Talcott, who was frequently absent. Yet his time would be short at Fort Monroe, as in 1834, Lee would be transferred to Washington DC to the War Department. Lee found the office work at the War Department to be monotonous, with the chances of being promoted relatively slim while the pay was even worse, but he would enjoy the birth of his first daughter, Mary Custis Lee, in 1835. During this time, General Gratio hardly visited the project sites, leaving Lee in charge of overseeing their progress. He was bound by endless red tape and would only be saved from the paperwork when he was dispatched to assist his old friend Captain Talcott in the Midwest Territories in 1835. In the state of Ohio and the territory of Michigan, fighting broke out over a small section of land known as the Toledo Strip. The Toledo Strip spanned 500 square miles and included the important port of Toledo. This conflict would eventually result in the Toledo War, which was little more than a brief skirmish, as the only injury was a Michigan deputy who was stabbed by a boy with a penknife. During the dispute, Captain Tolcott and Lieutenant Lee surveyed the area to better determine the boundaries of Ohio and Michigan, and ultimately, Michigan lost the Toledo Strip to Ohio, but in return, it received the Upper Peninsula, which would be the cause of the rivalry between Ohio and Michigan. Following his surveying of the Ohio and Michigan border, Lee was dispatched in 1837 to St. Louis to solve a major problem. The Mississippi River was cutting a new channel that threatened the port that brought trade to St. Louis, and Lee was the only suitable candidate to tackle the assignment. The port of St. Louis was an important transportation site, as many Americans who traveled west to California and Oregon would meet there, and should Lee fail, westward expansion might come to a complete halt. Lee had two objectives, save the port and waterfront and remove as many trees as possible from a 200-mile stretch of the Mississippi River along the Missouri-Iowa border. The technology of navigational engineering was still in its infancy during Lee's time in St. Louis, and Lee needed to find a way to curb the river's natural will to change direction. The Corps of Engineers had dumped tons of boxed sand around Bloody Island in order to push the current towards St. Louis and away from the new channel, but the boxes were smashed, 
which only worsened the situation by increasing the bar. After the wooden boxes failed, they tried using teams of oxen to dredge up the sand, yet that attempt too would ultimately fail. The river was not impossible to tame, as Lee had learned many lessons, and knew that he must create barriers that were strong enough to channel the current that would also create resistance to destroy the dikes. Lee reflected back to his days at West Point, specifically a French textbook on hydrodynamics, and used that as his inspiration for the project. The original idea was to use the undergrowth to snag debris that floated down the Mississippi River. The Lees had their third child on the 31st of May 1837, this time a boy, William Fitzhugh Lee. Despite being overjoyed at the newest addition to the family, the pay Lee was receiving in the army was slowly lessening his ability to take care of his family properly. But Lee's work in St. Louis did not go unnoticed, and in July of 1838, he was promoted to the rank of captain. In the summer of 1839, on the 18th of June, the Lees welcomed their fourth child, Anne Carter Lee, to the family. However, his work in St. Louis would be stopped by angry Illinois citizens who opened fire on his workers with cannons, out of fear that the progress Lee was making would cut them out of the increasingly lucrative trading along the Mississippi River. The Illinois citizens had hoped to prevent the growth of St. Louis in order to force trade through their city, and an injunction was issued by the Second Illinois Circuit halting all work on Bloody Island. Lee had worked hard to improve the conditions along the Mississippi, but by the summer of 1840, he returned to St. Louis to finalize the affairs of the army by selling the equipment it had purchased for the work. Lee was then reassigned to New York City to oversee the reconstruction of Forts Hamilton and Lafayette, along with the battery positions on Staten Island. The restoration of these fortifications was vitally important as the only major threat to American authority was Great Britain, as they were the only nation who had the means to bring the fight to American shores. Yet before his arrival in New York, the Lees had their fifth child, Eleanor Agnes Lee, on the 27th of February, 1841. His duties in New York were deemed significant enough to encourage his family to move with him, yet Mary and his children would not join him right away. Mary's unwillingness to move to New York at first was criticized by many, as she would have been expected to go wherever Lee went, yet in her defense, she had five children between 1832 and 1841, and suffered from arthritis and general poor health. Mary would join Lee in New York in the spring of 1843, but would leave shortly after when she found out she was pregnant with their sixth child, Robert E. Lee Jr., on the 27th of October, 1843. But Lee was still in New York, focusing on the forts. Although Lee was a skilled engineer, he had very few other accomplishments which would bring him the attention he deserved. However, he did have one highlight on his resume. Lee was named as a member of the Board of Examiners at West Point in 1844. He would spend two weeks at West Point overseeing and judging the final exams of the cadets, along with Major General Winfield Scott, the commanding officer of the US Army, who formed a positive opinion of Lee during the time they spent together. Scott was a large, towering figure of the day, also a hero from the War of 1812, with the nickname Old Fuss and Feathers. Lee was never the type of person to use flattery to advance himself, like many other officers, although this would never have worked on General Winfield Scott, as he was known to soak up flattery like a sponge. So Lee used his intelligence instead to impress him. The impression Lee made on General Winfield Scott gave him some advantages, as from 1844 to 1846, he acted as a congressional liaison for the Chief of Engineering while simultaneously working in New York. He was also appointed to be a member of the Board of Engineers for the Atlantic Coast Defense, and during this time, in early 1846, Mary gave birth to the Lee's final child, Mildred Child, who was affectionately called Millie by Lee. The action which Lee was seeking would eventually happen when events out west began to heat up. Mexico and the United States were trying to establish hegemony over the West, as the territory was increasing in population density. The origin of the disputes go back to 1810, when Moses Austin was granted land in Texas by the Mexican government. 
The Mexican government hoped the American settlers would provide a buffer between the raids of the Comanche tribe and the Mexican citizens. Instead, the Americans overwhelmed the Mexican government, who did not have the administrative or military ability to keep them in line. The ineffectiveness of the Mexican government to corral the American citizens would result in the overthrow of the government by General Antonio López de Santa Ana, who was nicknamed the Napoleon of the West. He would both threaten to take military action on the American settlers and offer to sell them more land. General Santa Ana made good on his threats and attacked the Texan-held mission called the Alamo. From the 23rd of February to the 5th of March in 1836, the 100-men garrison held off the 1,500-strong Mexican army, but the Alamo fell on the 6th of March. The women and children of the mission were allowed to leave, but the men were slaughtered at the site, leading to the famous battle cry, Remember the Alamo, which stirred the American public into a frenzy. Following the massacre at the Alamo, the Texans routed the Mexicans at the Battle of San Jacinto, which forced Mexico to recognize Texan independence. Ten years later, Texas would be annexed by the United States in 1845. Mexico was outraged at the annexation of Texas, while the northern states were irate at the addition of another slave state into the Union. Mexico broke off its diplomatic relations, yet President James Polk wished to maintain diplomatic relations in order to purchase California and New Mexico. Mexico continued to experience political instability, as the Mexican presidency changed four times, the Ministry of War six times and the Finance Ministry 16 times. Despite this instability, if there was anything that could unite the Mexican people, it was their hatred for losing Texas to the Americans. The border between the United States and Mexico was disputed as Mexico believed the border was along the Nueces River, while the United States believed the border lay along the Rio Grande. As a result, President Polk sent Brigadier General Zachary Taylor to occupy the land, but they were attacked by a Mexican cavalry unit, killing 16 Americans. The Thornton Affair, as it became known, gave the American government the cause to attack Mexico as Polk argued to Congress that American blood has been shed upon American soil. In response, General Taylor moved swiftly against the Mexican army, defeating them twice at Palo Alto and then at Resaca de la Palma. The Americans outclassed the Mexican army with its advanced weapons, which included the speedily deployed horse artillery and the Colt revolver. The outbreak of the Mexican War gave Lee the opportunity he was looking for to better his rank in the military, and on the 19th of August 1846, he would be dispatched to San Antonio de Bexar, Texas, to report to Brigadier General John E. Wool. General Wool and Captain Lee were stopped along the Rio Grande when a Mexican officer appeared with a flag of truce, reporting that General Taylor had defeated a Mexican army at the Battle of Monterey. Apparently, General Taylor had accepted an eight-week armistice in return for its surrender. This armistice, as Lee and others speculated, only served as a barrier to allow Santa Ana to recruit and train new soldiers to fight against the Americans, and on the night of the 18th of November, news reached camp that the armistice had been cancelled by President Polk to the relief of Lee and the other soldiers. Lee and the army advanced deep into enemy territory towards Paras, to support General Worth in Saltillo and arrived two days before Christmas. Lee led a scouting mission to determine the position of the Mexican army and was quite determined in his pursuit. His tenacity impressed General Wool, who made Lee his acting inspector general. Lee would learn that being persistent whilst carrying out reconnaissance paid off and also to not take exaggerated reports seriously. General Wool was ordered to join up with General Taylor in Buena Vista to support him against Santa Ana, where Santa Ana was routed by a force of 5,000 Americans against his 14,000 Mexican force. Lee left to join General Scott on the 17th of January 1847, and upon his arrival was accepted into Scott's general staff and inner circle. Lee was quartered on the flagship USS Massachusetts, sharing his room with former West Point classmate Joseph E. Johnston. In total, 12,000 men would be under General Scott's command for the invasion of Veracruz. Do you remember how you loved cereal as a kid? Would you like to live those days again? You can now with Magic Spoon, 
It's a tasty, nutritious cereal in delicious flavours like blueberry, cinnamon, maple waffle and even cookies and cream. Magic Spoon is not only delicious but also good for you. And there's a flavour for everyone. It comes in a four pack including frosted, cocoa, fruity and peanut butter flavours too, which are high in protein and good for you. There are zero grams of sugar, 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs and only 140 calories in each serving. So you can enjoy this amazingly tasty cereal without the slightest guilt. Magic Spoon is a healthy choice. It's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free and soy free. It's also low carb and it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today and be sure to use the promo code THEPEOPLEPROFILES at checkout to get $5 off any order or go to magicspoon.com forward slash thepeopleprofiles. On the 19th of February 1848, the fleet sailed to the Lobos Islands to rendezvous with the rest of their forces but were delayed due to smallpox outbreaks and a vicious storm. The fleet left on the 3rd of March and arrived in Vera Cruz on the 5th of March where Lee first saw the imposing island fortress of San Juan de Ulua, which guarded the city. Lee boarded the Petrita along with General Scott to survey the beaches, but the ship strayed too close to the fort, leading to an opening salvo from the fortress. This was the first time in Lee's 22-year-long military career that he had been under fire. On the 9th of March, 2,595 soldiers went ashore with no resistance from the Mexican army and during the night of the 22nd of March, the American mortars opened fire. By the 27th of March, Vera Cruz had fallen to the Americans. Lee's first taste of battle would leave him disheartened, as he would write to Mary that, It was awful. My heart bled for the inhabitants. The soldiers I did not care so much for, but it was terrible to think of the women and children. Lee never had a love for glory for his own sake, and his first battle left him melancholy. General Scott then looked to Mexico City, which was 280 miles away, but his supply lines would be stretched thin. The United States Army had no intelligence concerning where Santa Ana's army was located, let alone their size. Santa Ana had returned to Mexico City following his defeat at Buena Vista and raised a new force of 12,000. General Scott left Veracruz with 6,000 troops and found Santa Ana at Cerro Gordo, where he held an imposing defensive position. Following a reconnaissance mission, Lee informed General Scott there was a potential pathway they could cut to the extreme left flank of Santa Ana's line without them knowing. Scott agreed and gave Lee the opportunity to guide a division to the Mexican army and commence the battle on the 18th of April. In preparation for the assault, the soldiers started scaling the hill on the 17th of April, but they made too much noise and alerted the Mexican army, who started advancing down the hill. They countercharged up the hill, pushing the Mexican army back before finally establishing a hold on the summit of La Atalaya. Ultimately, the Mexicans were defeated at the Battle of Cerro Gordo, and the Americans only suffered minor casualties in comparison to the Mexican army. Lee's actions at the Battle of Cerro Gordo earned him a promotion to brevet major and praise from all of his superiors. Lee would leave with Scott, along with Lieutenants PGT Beauregard and George B. McClellan towards Mexico City. Following a small engagement at Molina del Rey, the army was now in position to assault Chapultepec, an important fortress, as it overlooked Mexico City, which would allow for continuous assaults. As a senior engineer, Lee argued against a direct assault on the fortress, but Lee was overruled and led Pillow's division to the west flank of Chapultepec. The first assault was pushed back, but the second assault was successful, with Lee climbing the slope accompanied by Lieutenants James Longstreet and George Pickett. Lee was injured during the assault, but was able to help General Pillow away from the battle. Following the fall of Chapultepec, nearly all Mexican resistance collapsed but Mexico City wouldn't be fully pacified until two days later due to Santa Ana releasing armed criminals from the local prison. It was a solemn peace, as many Americans believed they had bullied Mexico throughout the war. Lee would be promoted to brevet colonel for his actions at Chapultepec and eventually returned home on the 29th of June, 1848.
It took roughly 32 years from the time he started as a cadet at West Point for Lee to rise to brevet colonel, and in comparison to other officers of the time, he advanced only slightly faster than the average officer. While Lee would not receive a proper promotion, he was elevated to serve as the superintendent of West Point in 1852, a major accomplishment and a compliment to his teaching abilities. Although Lee was not thrilled at the prospect, as he unusually complained to his friend PGT Beauregard that there was an impossibility of either giving or receiving satisfaction from overseeing West Point. Nonetheless, he worked hard bettering the cavalry school by lobbying for new stables and a practice ring. It is also possible that Lee designed the new facilities himself, as they were very similar to the stables at Lee's home in Arlington. Under Lee's guidance, West Point produced the finest cavalry officers of the era. He cared about the well-being of the cadets, but he could not coddle them or else they would prove to be poor officers. West Point cadets were notorious for their high jinks along with their rowdiness and undisciplined behavior. As a result, Lee would turn towards corporal punishment, demerits, and the worst of cases, the expulsion of the cadet from the academy to maintain discipline. Those who did not possess the skills needed to become an officer were allowed to resign. Despite Lee's doubling down on disciplinary measures, the problems plaguing West Point were still not fixed during his two and a half year tenure. Lee received his first true promotion in March of 1855, when Secretary of War Jefferson Davis offered Lee a Lieutenant Colonel post in the 2nd Cavalry. This promotion would come at the cost of Lee's position in the Corps of Engineers, and also meant he had to leave his family behind. Whilst Lee had longed for the opportunity to leave the Corps of Engineers, his time in Texas would be unpleasant. A series of personal tragedies befell him, as both his mother-in-law and his sister Mildred died. A little over a year later, his father-in-law, George Custis, died in October of 1857. He was the only father figure in his life, and now he was gone. Not only did he lose family members, but he lost his favorite mare, who ran off with a wild horse. After his father-in-law's death, Lee returned to Arlington to settle the affairs of Custis' estate, which were in disarray due to years of neglect. Custis left his 196 slaves to their own devices towards the end of his life, only expecting them to cultivate their own personal gardens to grow their food. The change in ownership brought uncertainty, as they had no control over their destiny. Lee would invest a large sum of money into the estates to upgrade the living quarters for the slaves. Partially quote, to do what is right and best for the people but also because he needed their labor to make a profit to settle the debts Custis had left. As a result, Lee unintentionally caused disquiet amongst the slaves when he began hiring out slaves to other plantations without communicating how long they would be gone. The slave community at Arlington had been together since their time at Mount Vernon, as they had been allowed to stay together, unlike other slaves whose families had been broken up. Custis Will did free his slaves, as he was a member of the American Colonization Society. However, Lee made use of a provision which allowed him to retain them until the debt had been paid. As a result, the slaves began to test Lee's resolve to keep them on the plantation, sometimes in open rebellion. They asserted they were legally as free as Lee was, yet they had almost no legal grounds to declare their freedom. Some of those who attempted to test Lee were Wesley Norris, his sister Mary, and their cousin George Parks, who ran away from the plantation in late spring of 1859. They were eventually captured and brought back to Arlington. Accounts of their punishment spread in excruciating detail in the abolitionist papers, which would sometimes greatly exaggerate the accounts to generate attention. This does not mean the punishments such as whipping, which Norris received, were not true, as Lee and other witnesses do corroborate the general accounts of the event but they disagree with the exact details. Norris claimed that Lee personally whipped him and the other slaves as punishment, yet a man of Lee's standing in Southern society would never have doled out punishment himself. It would have been a blotch on Lee's social standing if he personally dealt the punishment, which may have been the reason behind the accusation. On the 17th of October, 1859, J.E.B. Stewart, otherwise known as Jeb Stewart, rode to Arlington requesting Lee attend the War Department immediately 
Lee immediately left with Stewart, entering into a meeting with President James Buchanan, along with several cabinet members. John Brown, an abolitionist, and 18 other men had just taken a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, killing a few civilians and taking hostages. Lee and Stewart were both sent via a special train to take control of the situation from the local militia, who corralled Brown's forces in the engine house of the arsenal. When Brown refused to surrender, the Marines sent with Lee stormed the engine house, leaving one Marine and two of Brown's freedom fighters dead. Lee would dismiss Brown's attempted revolution as the attempt of a fanatic or a madman that could only end in failure. Lee, along with many other future major players such as Thomas Jackson, Edmund Ruffin and John Wilkes Booth would watch Brown's execution. Unknown to Lee, Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry, Virginia had lit the fuse for the events of the next five years. Following the events in Harper's Ferry, Lee was asked to return to Texas in February of 1860. Many Southerners were relieved of their posts due to the increased talks of secession by Southern state representatives. Lee was appalled at the idea of deconstructing the country and saw it as anarchy. Yet Lee, like many others, would choose to side with whatever path their state would take. Americans had a sense of responsibility to family and state over the nation as a whole, which played a significant role in the coming conflict. He swore to never take arms against the United States. But if Virginia left the Union, he would give his life to defend her. Ultimately, the choice would be left to a statewide convention, but its decision would not be made soon. On the 13th of March, 1861, Lee attended a reception for military officers at the White House, where he met with Abraham Lincoln for the first and only time. President Lincoln knew of Lee's uncertain allegiance and hoped to maintain Lee within the Union. He offered him the position of Colonel in the 1st Regiment of Cavalry, a position Lee could not afford to turn down. Yet peace would become unattainable in early April when Lincoln decided to resupply Fort Sumter, which was being blockaded by rebel forces under the direction of PGT Beauregard. General Beauregard gave the order to fire on Fort Sumter on the 12th of April 1861, and Edmund Ruffins is credited with firing the first shots of the war. Fort Sumter would fall on the 14th of April 1861, and Lee underwent intense questioning from General Scott, requesting he either side with the Union or resign his commission. Lee resigned his commission on the 20th of April 1861 and boarded a train to Richmond to assess the situation. He never intended nor expected a commission in the Confederacy, but upon his arrival in Richmond, he learned he was to be offered Commander-in-Chief of all Confederate forces. As many have said, Lee's decision was an inevitable one he had to make and his fate would be tied to Virginia. Virginia officially seceded on the 23rd of May 1861 and as the decision was made, General Scott ordered Union troops across the Potomac, occupying parts of Virginia, including Lee's home in Arlington. Arlington would eventually be seized by the government for further military uses and following the first Battle of Bull Run would serve as a cemetery for the Union dead. Under the direction of Quartermaster General Montgomery Meggs, he ordered the dead be buried to encircle the entire house at Arlington. Lee was dismayed about being prohibited from leading the first engagement at Bull Run, yet was given the chance to push the Union from Cheats Mountain, but ultimately failed. He was then given a chance to redeem himself in the spring of 1862, as he took charge following the Battle of Seven Pines, where Joe Johnston was wounded. By the summer, General McClellan launched the Peninsula Offensive in the hope to move on Richmond, the Confederate capital. As a result, Lee ordered Ambrose P. Hill to strike at the Union flank on the 26th of June. The next week would be known as the Seven Days Battles. It was a tactical victory for the Confederates as McClellan was forced to retreat. Lincoln was appalled at McClellan's weakness and quickly replaced him with General John Pope. In August, Lee learned that Pope would receive reinforcements from McClellan, doubling the Union's forces. Lee called for Stonewall Jackson to join the Army of Northern Virginia to attack Pope at Bull Run. Lee's main force was led by General James Longstreet, who drove Pope's right flank across the Bull Run River. Pope's failure at the Second Battle of Bull Run led him to be replaced again by McClellan. With the Union pushed out of the South, Lee invaded Maryland 
sending Jackson to Harper's Ferry while Longstreet headed further north. Lee decided to reconvene his force of 40,000 to attack McClellan, despite McClellan's force doubling Lee's. Lee broke up his army in order to attack a large garrison of Union troops in Harper's Ferry, leaving him open to attacks. McClellan intercepted a copy of Lee's battle strategy and quickly moved to attack him, pushing his forces back from South Mountain. This small battle gave Lee time to select the battlefield of his choice in the town of Sharpsburg along the Antietam River. Lee made a tactical blunder by choosing Sharpsburg, or as it's better known, Antietam. Antietam is a cul-de-sac, saddled with the Potomac on two sides, and the Antietam River on the third, leaving only one exit for Lee to retreat to Virginia. However, Hooker seemed to be incompetent to lead the army, and he made several mistakes, such as leaving Porter's corps in the reserves and nearly his entire cavalry stacked on the left near a bridge. On the 17th of September 1862, the Union attacked Lee's left from the Hagerstown Pike and his center at Antietam, with a third attack planned for the right flank. William French's division from Summers' corps were ordered to attack the Confederate position of D. H. Hill's division stationed at the Bloody Lane. As the day went on, and the division holding the Bloody Lane was weakening, they fled from the position in a moment of confusion. Hooker did not take advantage of the situation though, and their assault ground to a halt. Hooker earlier in the day told Ambrose Burnside to attack, but he was slow to act. Burnside charged Rohrbach Bridge multiple times until they finally broke Toombs' division. Lee's right wing almost collapsed until A. P. Hill's division, which was force-marched from Harper's Ferry, saved the day. As A. P. Hill pushed Burnside's corps back to Antietam Creek, Lee and Jackson questioned the chances of a successful counterattack against Hooker's right flank. Ultimately, a wide-flanking maneuver was not possible, as Hooker was well positioned near the Potomac. In order for a counterattack to succeed, Jackson would have to march his corps through a corridor less than a mile wide with Meade positioned just above the North Woods. Jackson attempted to silence Meade's guns with Stuart's light, smoothbore guns, but were annihilated within 15 minutes. Ultimately, Jackson concluded that a counterattack would not be made on the Union's right flank, ordering his men and guns back to their original position. Antietam would be the single bloodiest day in American history with a combined loss of 22,700. While Lee left the field to McClellan, the loss on the Union side outweighed the territory gained. When McClellan failed to pursue, he was fired again from his post. The Pyrrhic victory at Antietam influenced Lincoln to announce the Emancipation Proclamation on the 22nd of September, freeing all slaves in the South, and although this had little authority, it did increase the flight of slaves to the North, who would fill the ranks of the Union Army. By the middle of November, Burnside took the Army of the Potomac across the Rappahannock River towards Fredericksburg, Virginia. Tactically, Burnside blundered by not rushing to Richmond as Lee was out of position. Floods caused by rainstorms prevented Burnside from taking advantage of the situation, allowing Lee time to reposition himself. Burnside's engineers braved Confederate sniper fire from Lee's army while building a pontoon bridge to assault their position. As a result, Burnside ordered artillery strikes on the town to suppress the snipers, but ultimately failed to stop them and only gave away his true intentions. Jackson's forces were called up from his positions at Skinner's Neck and Port Royal. Brigadier General William Barksdale was tasked with delaying Burnside's advance. However, he had other plans in mind. As Burnside tried to cross, Barksdale's men heavily contested the landing, making it the first opposed river crossing in American history. His small division refused to abandon Fredericksburg and fought in the narrow alleys and homes, also making it the first time urban combat was used in the Civil War. Barksdale would eventually be forced out by the growing presence of Union forces in the city, and on the 11th of December, a few more brigades entered into the city of Fredericksburg, who sacked the city of its valuables despite the orders of the Union officers to cease. Burnside spent all of the 12th of December moving his army across the Rappahannock River to position his attack. 
His plan was to take Sumner Grand Division and slam into Longstreet's left flank, while Franklin would attack Jackson's corps right flank in a pincer maneuver. In the meantime, Lee had positioned himself along the ridge line and the Fredericksburg railway cut, which A.P. Hill's division occupied. Burnside's strategy was suicidal due to the limitations of the ground suitable to attack, as regiment after regiment pushed towards Mary's height despite Lee's comfortable position behind the stone walls. The battle was a slaughter for the Union troops, as their dead numbered double the amount Lee lost. Burnside wished to continue the attack, but his generals encouraged him to withdraw. His poor performance and his use of the troops at his disposal led him to be replaced by General Joseph Hooker. In May of 1863, Lee would get the chance to test Hooker on the battlefield at Chancellorsville, Virginia. Hooker was ambitious as he split his forces into three columns, with his far left column advancing along the southern Rappahannock and the other two advancing through the wilderness towards Chancellorsville. He planned to double envelope Lee by attacking his front and rear simultaneously. Hooker also sent his entire cavalry to raid towards Richmond, which left him entirely blind to Lee's movement. Lee split his forces into two, sending Jubal early with 10,000 troops to Fredericksburg to deter General Sedgwick from attacking, while Lee took 50,000 troops to face Hooker. Lee's decision to split his forces caught Hooker off guard and, as a result, he recalled his two corps from their strategically advantageous position back to Chancellorsville. These two corps had already advanced on the enemy's position and were infuriated at having to withdraw through the wilderness again, losing their tactical advantage. Jackson followed cautiously and met with Lee at night to discuss the situation. Lee was vastly outnumbered against Hooker, especially since he had sent Longstreet's corps to confront attacks south of Richmond and forage for supplies. Yet despite this, the Army of Northern Virginia took an aggressive stance. Instead of taking a defensive position, Jackson undertook a risky 16-mile march around the flank of General Howard's 11 Corps. Jackson deployed four brigades in the evening on the 2nd of May at 5 p.m. and issued a simple order you may go forward. As Jackson unleashed his men to pounce on the Union flank, scores of wild animals ran from the woods as though they were fleeing a fire. Jackson rolled up the Union 11 Corps flank, catching them completely by surprise and driving them from the field. Many pockets of resistance formed and eventually the maneuver slowed down. This daring flank attack caused Hooker to form a defensive horseshoe around Chancellorsville. Following his successful flanking, Jackson went with a few fellow officers at night to scout the new Union position. Upon running across a Union picket, they returned back to their lines where they were mistaken for Union cavalry and fired upon. Jackson was fatally wounded and would die eight days later of pneumonia. Lee was in distress over the news and famously said in regard to Jackson's wound that, quote, he has lost his left arm, but I have lost my right. Then, after Stonewall's retirement from the field, A.P. Hill, with whom Jackson had a personal feud, was himself wounded in the fighting, resulting in Jeb Stuart assuming command of the Corps. However, he had never commanded infantry before, and so he resolved to wait until he could receive instructions. Lee and Stuart attacked simultaneously against Hooker, who had been knocked unconscious before the battle had begun when a cannonball struck the house Hooker was staying in. By 10 a.m. on the 3rd of May, the Union Army retreated across the Rappahannock, leaving Chancellorsville to Lee. Yet, at the same time, Lee learned that General Early had been pushed from his position in Fredericksburg by General Sedgwick upon him learning of Jackson's flanking of Hooker. This attack would go no further as Sedgwick retreated from his position following the failed attack to rout Early, and Lee would turn his attentions to the north following his victory at Chancellorsville. Lee's plan was to take the war to the north, as much of his time campaigning had been spent in Virginia. The death of Jackson left a considerable hole in Lee's leadership, and as a result, he broke his two corps into three, retaining Longstreet and promoting A.P. Hill and Richard Ewell to corps commanders. This new structure would be awkward, as Longstreet held the experience, while Ewell was indecisive and Hill almost too aggressive. Lee took his army of 75,000 into Pennsylvania 
where they would eventually land at the town of Gettysburg. Hooker followed Lee, but would ultimately be replaced by George Meade, who placed himself between Lee's army and Washington, D.C. Jeb Stuart uncharacteristically left Lee's army to raid further north and harass the Army of the Potomac to try and atone for his humiliation at Brandy Station, but instead left Lee blind and guessing as to the whereabouts of the Union Army. On the 1st of July, 1863, Union Cavalry General John Buford held the ground on McPherson's Ridge when elements of Henry Heth's division appeared and started to push them off the ridge. Just as Buford was about to be forced off the ridge, Reynolds' 1st Corps showed up to support him, and Reynolds was cut down while ordering troops into the gap. The Confederates' attacks were uncoordinated at first, but ultimately broke the Union Army by early afternoon, who retreated in chaos, jamming up the streets. Lee gave his most unclear order to his newest corps commander, Ewell, as he was instructed to take Cemetery Ridge if practicable. Ewell, being indecisive, did not believe he would be able to take Cemetery Ridge with his men and decided to rest them for the remainder of the day. The Union was now organizing on Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge, all of which would be important to win the battle. At night, Longstreet implored Lee to rethink his strategy, head south and position themselves between Meade and Washington DC and wait for the Union to attack them on their own terms. Lee was determined to break the Union Army, forgetting everything he had learned while at West Point, and more specifically, his lessons he learned by reading from Napoleon. On the 2nd of July, Lee focused the attacks on the wing of the Union Army, which had formed a fishhook to allow for fast deployment of troops where they were needed. The eager and arrogant Corps Commander Daniel Sickles disobeyed orders and broke from the Union line occupying the Sherfee's Peach Orchard forcing Meade to desperately fill in the gaps. Longstreet sent Hood's 4 Division to attack Sickles' position, while Hill threatened the center and Ewell was tasked with taking Cemetery Hill. Longstreet's attack was successful as Sickles was overrun from his position. Fierce fighting continued around Little Round Top, which was protected by the 20th Maine, because if Little Round Top fell, the whole Union Army could have been rolled from its flank. Meanwhile, on the right flank, Ewell started his attack in the evening and easily overwhelmed portions of Cemetery Ridge, yet Union reinforcements were able to push them back. On the third day of the battle, Lee believed that the Union center was weak, which in theory should have been correct, but he was wrong as Meade had reinforced his corps, guessing Lee would initiate his attack in the center. Lee had been effectively beaten already at Gettysburg and yet made the questionable decision to attack Meade's center. In March of 1863, Lee suffered a medical episode. The exact diagnosis was unknown, but it was cardiac related. This medical event potentially caused Lee to make the controversial decision to charge Meade's center using Pickett's division, now known as Pickett's Charge. Pickett's division would have to march over one mile of open ground to reach the Union line, exposed to both Union artillery and then rifles at short range. Lee started with a grand artillery barrage to soften the Union center, which failed to respond to the attacks. Believing the barrage had worked, when in fact the Confederate artillery had overshot the Union line, Pickett's charge proceeded as planned. Only when the Confederates came out of the woods and were at the point of no return, did the Union artillery open fire. Those Confederates who made it to the Union line were either killed or captured, completely shattering Pickett's division. Lee's defeat at Gettysburg broke the Army of Northern Virginia, and they retreated back to Virginia, having lost more than a third of his army in the three-day battle, in which half alone were killed in Pickett's charge. Lee would not engage with the Union Army again until the 4th of May, 1864, in the Battle of the Wilderness, where he faced off against General Ulysses S. Grant. Longstreet would be wounded by his own troops and be out of action for six months, while Lee and Grant bloodied each other in consistent counterattacks against one another. Lee personally led from the front until his men forced him to the rear by guiding his horse away from the battle. Lee would pull back to Spotsylvania and prepare for Grant's first assault on the 7th of May, leading to a nearly two week long battle as Grant tried to navigate around Lee. Grant would lead a doomed assault on Cold Harbor in June, 
despite having the numerical advantage against Lee. He would follow up this failure with the nine-month-long siege of Petersburg from June of 1864 to April of 1865, when he finally took the city, forcing Lee to retreat. Lee was no longer able to protect Richmond, which fell on the 3rd of April 1865. Grant pursued Lee with the help of General Sheridan and divisional leader George Custer, cutting off retreats and attacking supply wagons relentlessly. The hounding by the Union forces became too much for the beleaguered Army of Northern Virginia, and on the 9th of April 1865, Lee surrendered to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. The terms were much more generous than Lee had imagined as the side arms of officers, private horses and baggage were protected from seizure and each officer and man were allowed to return home on parole, so long as they observed their parole terms. Lee spent the next few days overseeing the disarming and disbanding of the army until the 12th of April, when he left for Richmond. The Civil War would officially end on the 13th of May, 1865. After the Civil War, Lee lived a relatively quiet life, accepting a president's position at Washington College. Lee would be harassed by the Northern press throughout his time at Washington College for, quote, bringing up rebels, despite Lee trying to remove himself from the resentment many Southerners felt from losing the war, even scolding Jefferson Davis and Jubal Early for their aggressive outbursts after the war. Lee did lose his citizenship and right to vote as a result of his part in the Civil War, but these would be ultimately restored under President Johnson's second amnesty for Confederate veterans on the 25th of December, 1868. On the 28th of September, 1870, Lee was following his normal workday before attending a church meeting and then coming home for supper. Mrs. Lee poured him a cup of tea and as he spoke to say grace, nothing came out of his mouth. Lee had had a stroke, and after two weeks, Robert E. Lee passed away on the 12th of October, 1870, at 10 a.m. Robert E. Lee holds a unique place in American history. He has been described as, quote, a Caesar without his ambition, a Frederick without his tyranny, a Napoleon without his selfishness, and a Washington without his reward. While Lee's view on race is abhorrent in today's light, we must judge him by the era he lived in, and the question remains, would Lee be received better today if he had stayed in the Union Cavalry? Lee is often romanticized in the aftermath of his death as part of the Lost Cause narrative, the belief that the South fought for a righteous cause. Lee himself would have vehemently disagreed that the South cause was just, as he opposed the construction of statues of Confederate icons following the war believing it would prevent the healing of the nation. Lee was a man filled with the potential for greatness, yet his fault at the critical moment was choosing to side with what he felt was right for himself, as many did in the Civil War. Robert E. Lee historian Elizabeth Pryor is brilliant in her analysis of Lee and asserts that, quote, we want him to be great because he has elements of greatness in him, but he falls short because Greatness must rest on two pillars. For Lee to be considered great, he must, quote, create something that not only benefits the world each day, but endures and embodies a far-sightedness that reaches beyond the complacency of one's narrow experience. Lee even admits the immorality of slavery, but does not act against the institution he knows is morally wrong. And while after the war he called for unity, he resisted change that would ultimately better the world. What do you think of Robert E. Lee? Was he wrong to fight for the Confederacy and in doing so support states built on slavery? Or was he an honorable man who defended his home of Virginia to the last and remains arguably America's greatest military commander of all time? Please let us know in the comments section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Ulysses S. Grant was born as Hiram Ulysses Grant on the 27th of April 1822 in Point Pleasant, a small rural community in the southwest of the relatively young state of Ohio. His father was Jesse Root Grant, a farmer 
tanner and leather merchant who hailed originally from Pennsylvania and who could trace his ancestry in America back to the first establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. Jesse had moved westwards along with so many Americans in the early 19th century in search of new opportunities as the United States expanded from the east coast of North America. Ulysses' mother was Hannah Grant, originally Hannah Simpson. Her ancestry lay amongst the Presbyterian Scots, who had moved from Scotland to Ulster in the north of Ireland during the 17th century, and then emigrated again in great numbers from Ireland to North America in the course of the 18th century. She had married Jesse Grant in 1821, and Ulysses was their first child. She was a deeply religious woman, and Ulysses is believed to have taken after his mother more than his father, although he might well have acquired his anti-slavery stance from Jesse, who was a proclaimed abolitionist, meaning that he wished for slavery to be brought to an end throughout the United States. Ulysses would grow up in a large household, as he had five siblings, Simpson, Clara, Orville, Jenny, and Mary. The family was well enough off that Ulysses was provided with a substantial education at numerous private schools. This included a stint at the Rankin Academy in 1838. This was run by John Rankin, a noted abolitionist and educator who was prominent in running the Underground Railroad at the time. This was a system of safe houses and transport networks which abolitionists in America used to help escape slaves in the southern states of America to flee from slavery. Grant was growing up at a time when the United States was expanding swiftly, having largely been confined to a series of states along the eastern seaboard of North America in the 18th century. American eyes were turning west from 1800 onwards, with expansion towards the Great Lakes in the north and westwards towards the Mississippi River and the border with Spain's colonial possessions in Texas, New Mexico, and California. Beyond this territorial expansion, the social fabric of the country was shifting dramatically. Under British rule, slavery had been practiced throughout the colonies, though it was engaged in to a much greater extent in the southern colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia, with their sprawling cotton and tobacco plantations. Change was on the way, though as by 1800, a number of northern states, including New York, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, inspired by the abolitionist movement, had banned slavery. By the time of Grant's birth, others, such as New Jersey, had become free states, while the period of his youth and adolescence saw the states directly to the west, such as Illinois and Michigan, follow their more liberal neighbors to the east but the southern states remained unswerving in their defense of the institution of slavery. And so, the stage was already being set, during Grant's youth, for a titanic struggle between the northern and southern states. Ultimately, Ulysses would find himself foisted into the conflicts of American society in the mid-19th century, owing to a decision made by his father in 1839. At this time, when Ulysses was still just 17, his father requested an acquaintance to nominate his son to the United States Military Academy at West Point in the state of New York, then, as now, the leading military academy in the United States. The application was successful, though, owing to an error in his registration, Hiram Ulysses Grant was recorded as Cadet Ulysses S. Grant on entry. This new name stuck. Grant was initially skeptical about life at West Point, but he eventually grew into it, acquiring a reputation while there for his equestrian skills, though, more broadly, he was only an average pupil. When he graduated in June 1843, he did so ranked 21st of 39 cadets in his class. Having finished at West Point, he was quickly appointed to the 4th Infantry Division and sent to St. Louis in the state of Missouri as a brevet second lieutenant. Grant seems to have been relatively uncommitted to a military career at this point and considered this a temporary posting, from which he might retire in a year or two. Yet, it was a highly significant period in other ways. While at West Point, Grant had befriended Frederick Tracy Dent, a fellow cadet who was slightly older than Ulysses. Dent originally hailed from Whitehaven near St. Louis 
and Grant became a regular visitor at the Dent household following his arrival in Missouri. He had soon struck up a relationship with Dent's sister, Julia, and in 1844 they were engaged. The union, though, would not be formalized into a marriage for another four years, as war on the southern border interrupted their plans in this regard. The war, which erupted in 1846, was the direct result of the contentious position of Texas between the United States and Mexico, traditionally part of Spain's colonial possessions in Central America. Texas had become part of Mexico when the country acquired independence from its mother country, Spain, in the early 1820s. However, Texas's position within the broader Mexican state was always contentious, and in 1836, it broke away into a new Republic of Texas. Thereafter, it gravitated towards the US, and when he was elected as president late in 1844, a major plank of James Polk's policy platform was expansion of the United States into Texas. This was duly accomplished in 1845, with the formal annexation of the Republic of Texas. However, Mexico was unwilling to accept this new dispensation. In particular, a boundary dispute arose over where the new border between the US and Mexico should lie. Polk's administration favoring the Rio Grande and the Mexican government arguing that the frontier should be located along the more northerly Nueces River. These issues spilled over into war in 1846. Grant's role in the war was limited as a junior officer, but also formative in its own way, as he fought at the Battle of Palo Alto, the first major clash of the war, near Brownsville in Texas on the 8th of May 1846. It was also the first time Grant had seen active combat. He subsequently served as a regimental quartermaster further west, towards California, and then in Mexico itself in 1847. He earned a commendation for his role in the Battle of Molino del Rey, fought near Mexico City in September 1847. And so, while he did not have any major command during the US-Mexican War, it is increasingly viewed as an important period in his career as a military commander. It was between 1846 and 1848 that Grant gained his first experience of warfare and it was to be the only war he fought in prior to the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861 and as such, it must be considered his most active training period for the later conflict. Ultimately, the US-Mexican War ended in a total US victory. Having secured the border regions in the opening months of the conflict, General Winfield Scott advanced into Mexico itself in the spring of 1847, eventually occupying Mexico City, a campaign which Grant was involved in. The resulting Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, agreed in February 1848, saw Mexico acknowledge US control over Texas, while the Rio Grande was established as the border between the two nations. Consequently, while the US did not take the opportunity provided by its complete military victory to acquire further land from Mexico, the peace essentially consolidated its position in Texas and established the modern border between the two countries. In the aftermath of the US-Mexican War, Grant returned to St. Louis and married Julia Dent. Theirs was a close relationship, though initially it caused a rupture between Grant and his parents, who were discontented with the Dents being slave owners. Despite their family squabbling, which continued with varying degrees of intensity for decades to come, there is little doubting Ulysses and Julia's affection for one another. She had a cast in her left eye and squinted as a result of it, a characteristic which years later, when Ulysses became president, she considered having surgery to correct. He vetoed the idea, stating that he loved her just as she was. Evidently, it was Julia's liveliness and other character traits which made Ulysses devoted to her. Eventually, they would have four children, three boys, Frederick, Ulysses Jr., and Jesse, and a girl named Ellen. But Ulysses and Julia's early family life was repeatedly interrupted by Grant's military postings. In the years following the US-Mexican War, he was moved around several times to different military commands in Detroit and New York State. But it was finally to California that he was dispatched in the early 1850s. Gold had been discovered out on the West Coast, and as settlement increased there around the middle of the century, a heightened military presence was needed. 
Julia was heavily pregnant at the time, and Grant was forced to leave her in the East, while he headed west. The next few years were a bleak period. Grant was moved around repeatedly across California and the Oregon Territory. In an effort to better support his young family back home, he entered into several business ventures on the side, each of which failed. Then he started drinking more heavily, the beginnings of a long acquaintance he would have with the bottle. And eventually, it was repeated acts of drunkenness and the clashes these caused with his commanding officers which led him to resign from the military on the 31st of September 1854. Thus, at 32 years of age, and with no idea of what he might do henceforth, Grant headed back east to St. Louis to be reunited with his wife and family. Life outside the military, though, did not bring any relief from his hardships, as back in St. Louis, things went from bad to worse. Having accepted a farm allotment from Julia's father, he nevertheless continued to struggle financially, in part owing to an economic recession in the US in 1857. A venture into real estate proved abortive, and in the late 1850s, Grant was reduced to selling firewood on a St. Louis Street corner to make some extra cash, and even pawned a gold watch, a prized possession, at one point. Years later, F. Scott Fitzgerald would state that there are no second acts in American life. He should perhaps have considered the highly successful second act of Ulysses S. Grant before making this assertion. In the early 1860s, Grant's life was to take a striking turn, brought about almost entirely by the crisis which enveloped America in the aftermath of the election of Abraham Lincoln as the 16th President of the United States in the presidential election of November 1860. Tensions had been brewing for decades between the free states in the north of the United States and the slave-owning states of the south. Now in 1860, Lincoln, though willing to compromise with the slave-owning states, was built into a bogeyman by the southern states, one who would seek to end slavery altogether in America. As a result, upon his election, the state of South Carolina seceded from the Union in December 1860. It was soon joined by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas in that decision, and these seven breakaway southern states formed themselves into a confederacy. Outright armed hostilities between the Northern Union and the Southern Confederacy commenced in April 1861 when Confederate forces attacked a Union-held garrison at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, following which several more southern states seceded and joined the Confederacy, the capital of which was eventually established at Richmond in Virginia. The American Civil War had begun. Upon the outbreak of hostilities in the spring of 1861, Grant rejoined the army after a near seven-year absence, in the initial stages of the conflict, he was involved in efforts to recruit and train forces in Missouri and Illinois, but it was not long before he had been given a command in southern Illinois, based on his previous military experience. He would spend the first year of the war operating in the border region between southern Illinois and Kentucky, and further south towards Tennessee, playing a delicate balancing act in areas where military heavy-handedness was frowned upon in the hopes that these communities straddling the North and the South could be won over to the Union cause. At the beginning of 1862, frustrated by his lack of major commands, Grant sought and received permission from General Henry Halleck to undertake an offensive campaign. Campaigning South with 25,000 men, he won one of the first major victories of the war for the Union when he besieged and captured Fort Donelson on the River Cumberland in Tennessee. About 15,000 Confederate troops in total were captured in the engagement. Moreover, Grant had proved his daring and activist approach. When the commander of Fort Donelson had inquired as to what terms of surrender might be offered, Grant had replied that the only terms he was prepared to offer were unconditional surrender, as he intended to move presently against the fort. As a result of his actions at Fort Donelson, Grant was now promoted to the rank of Major General. Two months later, he was the Major Union Commander at the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee on the 6th of April 1862, where over 100,000 Union and Confederate troops fought. 
Grant was theoretically victorious and repelled the Confederate incursion into the region, but it was a Pyrrhic victory, which resulted in over 10,000 Union troops being either killed or wounded. Grant's reputation, which had soared following the seizure of Fort Donelson, was now damaged. This was probably not aided by reports of his drinking. While we can probably dismiss legendary tales about Grant keeping a barrel of whiskey outside his tent while on campaign during the Civil War, there seems to be much truth to allegations that he was a heavy binge drinker on occasion, although one who often abstained for considerable periods of time. The most likely scenario suggests that Grant was prone to bouts of heavy drinking, but rarely drank heavily when he knew some important task lay ahead of him. Despite these setbacks, before the end of 1862, Grant had convinced his superiors to allow him to proceed towards Mississippi, where he planned to seize Vicksburg, one of the Confederates' major strongholds on the Mississippi River. This he duly succeeded in accomplishing six months later, when it finally surrendered on the 4th of July 1863. Grant's actions here were particularly notable, as the Vicksburg campaign ensured Union control of the Mississippi River effectively cutting the Confederacy in two, between those states further to the west and the core of the southern states to the east of the Mississippi. While Grant was making a major name for himself in Tennessee and Mississippi, the war was proceeding with mixed results for both sides. While 1861 had seen the outbreak of the war and the consolidation of the Confederacy, in 1862 it settled into a particularly intense campaign in the eastern states around Virginia, Maryland and Delaware, where the Union and Confederacy were in the peculiar position of having their respective capitals less than 100 miles away from each other. But it was in 1863 that the war really turned. It was this year that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, making the abolition of slavery in the Confederate States a stated war goal for the Union. Henceforth, it was clear that victory for the Union in the war would mean an end to the institution of slavery throughout the United States. Having won a significant victory repelling the Union forces at Chancellorsville in Virginia, the leading Confederate general Robert E. Lee undertook a campaign into the north through Pennsylvania in the early summer of 1863. This culminated in the three-day-long Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania between the 1st and 3rd of July the bloodiest engagement of the entire Civil War. Gettysburg saw Lee's Army of Northern Virginia heavily defeated, with nearly 25,000 of his 75,000-man army either killed or wounded. It was a turning point in the entire conflict, which combined with Grant's seizure of Vicksburg to the west a day later on the 4th of July, put the Union on the offensive. It has also gone down in history, as much for Lincoln's address to mark the battle the following November, in which he spoke of the great civil war being fought to ensure that freedom shall not perish from the earth. Meanwhile, in recognition of his prowess in the field and accomplishments in the seizure of Vicksburg and other strategic sites, Grant was appointed as Lieutenant General in March 1864 and placed in overall command of the Union Army. He was now in charge of the effort to finally defeat the Confederacy and bring the war to an end. Grant's strategy was relatively simple in 1864. He intended to use the Union's numerical superiority to essentially confine Robert E. Lee's forces, protecting Richmond within the state of Virginia, while several of his sub-commanders would conduct campaigns further to the south and southwest, for instance, seizing Georgia. This strategy was broadly successful elsewhere, although despite the tightening of the noose on Richmond, Grant failed to take the Confederate capital in 1864, even after a near two-week-long bloody engagement at Cold Harbor some ten miles from the city ended in a stalemate. Grant's forces now settled, in June 1864, into what would become a nine-month siege of the town of Petersburg, not far from Richmond. As it wore on, though, the siege of Petersburg became symptomatic of the Confederate cause in general. The breakaway affiliation was now largely confined to isolated centers of control out further west in Alabama and Texas, and a strip of land running along the east coast around Virginia and parts of the Carolinas and Georgia, 
By the autumn of 1864, the city of Atlanta in Georgia had been captured and the Union Army had advanced as far as the Atlantic coast in parts of the South. As the winter set in, Lee's troops in Virginia began to desert in large numbers, owing to starvation and the general hopelessness of the Confederate cause. And by the spring of 1865, Lee's position was hopeless. The American Civil War eventually came to an end on the 9th of April 1865. A week earlier, Lee had abandoned the line which he had been trying to hold around Petersburg. Richmond was now open to a Union advance. As a result, on the 9th of April, Lee agreed to meet with Grant in the courthouse in the village of Appomattox in Virginia to negotiate the surrender of the Confederacy. Here, the two generals reminisced about their experiences in the war with Mexico nearly 20 years earlier, before getting round to the business of ending the Civil War. Grant, for his part, was authorized to negotiate that there would be few reprisals of any kind for those who laid down their weapons. As a result, when word spread west to the Confederate forces in those states, the surrender was quickly agreed to, and the last fighting occurred in Texas at the end of May. Yet the man who had been at the center of these events would never live to see the ultimate cessation of hostilities. On the 14th of April, just five days after Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, a stage actor and Confederate sympathizer, in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Grant himself had nearly been present with Lincoln, having turned down an offer to attend the performance with the president. Indeed, allegations flew in the days that followed that Grant was also a target of Booth and his co-conspirators. They were unsuccessful if he was. Grant lived, and Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's vice president, was sworn in as the great man's successor. The end of the war witnessed the inception of the policy of reconstruction. On the surface, this was aimed primarily at bringing slavery to an end in the Confederate States and ending the remnants of secession in the South. But such was the manner in which slavery was ingrained into every aspect of the economy and society of the Southern States that Reconstruction would also necessarily require a massive program of social and economic reform if the Southern States were to evolve to become more like their more liberal Union neighbors to the North. Reconstruction would dominate U.S. politics during the immediate aftermath of the war and primarily throughout Grant's presidency from 1869 to 1877. Even prior to his tenure in the White House, Grant was involved in Reconstruction politics. In the months after the conclusion of the Civil War, he was sent on a tour of the southern states at the behest of President Johnson. This was important for two reasons. Grant was received favorably during his travels throughout the former Confederate states, somewhat surprisingly given his position as the Union's foremost general. This indicated that he could be a unifying figure during the Reconstruction period. Secondly, Grant submitted a report to Johnson upon completion of his tour, in which he recommended a lenient approach towards the former Confederate states he had just visited in order to help end the bitterness of the Civil War. His drift towards politics did not end there. In 1866, he was appointed a general of the Federal Army. Now that the Union titles of recent years were dispensed with, and then, in 1867, when Johnson removed Edwin M. Stanton from his position as Secretary of War, Grant was offered the position. Grant accepted the office on an interim basis in August 1867. However, a constitutional problem now arose surrounding the Tenure of Office Act. This dictated that a sitting cabinet secretary could only be removed by the executive with the consent of the Senate. As such, Johnson needed Stanton's removal to be sanctioned by the Upper House of Congress. When the Senate refused to approve Stanton's dismissal in December 1867, Grant resigned in January, provoking a split with Johnson in the process, who had believed that Grant would refuse to relinquish his position as Secretary of War. This resulted in the decision over Stanton being sent to the courts for adjudication, Johnson's desired outcome. The major outcome of the split from Johnson and Grant's brief flirtation with the office of Secretary of War was that he was now viewed as a potential presidential candidate within the Republican Party. 
At the Republican National Convention in Chicago in mid-May 1868, Grant won the party's support. He would run against the Democrat Horatio Seymour, a former governor of the state of New York. The Civil War hero ran in the months that followed on a campaign slogan of Let us have peace. Ultimately, the election race was much closer than many observers had expected. Overall, Grant won by just 300,000 votes in the popular vote, although the Electoral College result was much more comprehensive, Grant securing 214 votes compared to just 80 for Seymour. As a result, on the 4th of March 1869, Ulysses S. Grant was sworn into office as the 18th President of the United States. He would serve for eight years, winning a second term in 1872, with a much more comprehensive victory over a divided opposition. During the eight years in which he served as President of the United States, Grant would have to grapple with a large number of very grave challenges. None was more pressing than the issue of reconstruction and the reunifying of the country after the trauma of a four-year civil war. Two weeks after entering office, he signed laws guaranteeing African Americans equal rights. Then, in the months that followed, his administration pressured those former Confederate states which had not ratified the 15th Amendment into doing so. This would guarantee black Americans the right to vote in elections. The trade-off for the southern states in accepting this would be readmittance to the Union once it had been ratified by each state legislature. As a result of this carrot-and-stick approach, by 1871, the recalcitrant states, including Georgia, Virginia, Mississippi, and Texas, had complied and were readmitted to the Union. But in other respects, Reconstruction under Grant proved more difficult. Armed bands of traditional Southern conservatives sprung up across the former Confederate states in the late 1860s and early 1870s. The Ku Klux Klan was just the most prominent of these, and others, such as the Red Shirts and White League, collectively termed Redeemers, strove to use violence and intimidation to reclaim control of the southern states of the Democratic Party and force through a white supremacist agenda. In response, Grant's administration created the U.S. Justice Department and charged it with cracking down on white Redeemer movements in the South. In tandem, the Federal Army was dispatched to key sites in order to maintain law and order and defend Reconstruction. The result, it is generally acknowledged, is that Grant's administration crushed the power of the Ku Klux Klan for a generation in the South by arresting hundreds of senior members and prosecuting many of its most powerful benefactors who financed the Klan. Nevertheless, despite these efforts, it was clear by the mid-1870s that Reconstruction was largely failing and Redeemer Democrats were seeking to create a society in the South, which, in the absence of slavery, would still disenfranchise and savagely oppress the large African-American population across the former Confederate states. Reconstruction was intimately tied to the finances of the country. During the war, the Union government had resorted to issuing banknotes that were not backed up by the gold or silver standard. In the 19th century, all Western governments only issued money that was backed by a certain amount of gold and silver bullion reserves. The emergency caused by the Civil War had seen Lincoln's administration resorting to simply printing banknotes, resulting in considerable inflation. To correct the situation, Grant passed the Public Credit Act within three weeks of entering office. This essentially promised those who held banknotes issued during the Civil War that they would be repaid in coin backed by the gold and silver standard. The idea here was to curb inflation and also introduce much greater confidence into the financial system that the Civil War banknotes, termed green banknotes, were as good as real money and would not become worthless now that the war was receding in the collective memory. The overall effect of this was a continuation of the economic recovery, which had already started under Johnson's administration between 1865 and 1869. Yet it was not all smooth sailing on the financial front across the eight years of Grant's administration. In 1873, an economic crisis developed following the collapse of the New York brokerage firm J. Cook & Company, which was heavily involved in the railway building boom of the time. As the West and East Coasts were connected via extensive train lines, 
This was compounded by frailties in the global economic system, with Germany having demonetized silver in the aftermath of the unification of the country in 1871, triggering a series of financial failures in European capitals such as Vienna. The resulting downturn led to an economic depression which would linger for the remainder of Grant's second term, creating financial hardship for many American citizens. The economic crisis was known at the time as the Great Depression, but this term was abandoned 70 years later when a much deeper economic crisis led to the period after the Wall Street crash of 1929 becoming known as the Great Depression. Accordingly, the economic crash and depression of 1873 to 1877 is today termed the Panic of 1873. On the foreign stage, Grant's policies were calm and pacificist. Despite his military background, he was no warmonger and deliberately tried to avoid conflict. However, he was also thoroughly inexperienced as a diplomat and left his foreign policy largely in the hands of the Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish. A number of issues confronted the US in the late 1860s. Firstly, the matter of reparations and an apology from the British government for its supplying of naval support to the Confederacy during the Civil War remained unresolved. Several years of negotiations eventually resulted in the Treaty of Washington in 1871, whereby Britain acknowledged its role in building ships for the Confederacy and agreed to pay over $15 million in reparations. Thereafter, US-British relations improved steadily, and the two countries have been allies ever since. Just as pressing was the US's policy in the Caribbean, where a war, the Ten Years' War, had broken out between Cuban rebels and Spain in 1868. Despite occurring on its front door, the US maintained a policy of fairly strict neutrality in this, the first of three independence wars waged on the island of Cuba in the second half of the 19th century. More interventionist was the approach of the Grant administration to the island of Hispaniola. Then, as now, this was divided into two countries, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, or Santo Domingo. Grant was of the view that by acquiring control over Santo Domingo, the US could gain a strategic interest in the Caribbean and also in the lucrative sugar trade of the region. In 1869, negotiations were opened with the government there to purchase the country, with US business interests acting as intermediaries. But after 18 months of wrangling over this, the scheme came to nothing, largely owing to the opposition from within Congress. The affair tarnished Grant's reputation to some extent and is an indication of the creeping imperialist aspirations of the US in advance of the most aggressive period of American empire in the 1890s. Grant's approach towards the Native American people was enlightened by 19th century standards. He was a relatively benign assimilationist, believing that the Native American people should be treated fairly and enjoined to embrace the benefits of a Western education, economy, culture and government. This might seem like a heavy-handed form of cultural intolerance by today's standards, but for a country which counted several presidencies in the 1830s, 1840s and 1850s, whose policies towards the Native American people had bordered on genocidal, Grant's approach was comparatively progressive. As a result, several peace treaties were negotiated with the Apache and Sioux, ends of the Plains and Midwest during his first term in office and conflict between the Native American people and the federal government was at an historic low. However, Grant's Native American policy could ultimately not escape the historical circumstances in which it was conceived. Try as he might to forge a new pathway, decades of conflict, oppression and broken promises had created a thick air of animosity towards the US government amongst the Plains Indians. This was compounded in 1874 when gold was discovered in the Black Hills of Dakota Territory. As prospectors streamed into the region, the Sioux Indians there, led by Red Cloud, Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, prepared for conflict. The Great Sioux War of 1876 and 1877 was a bitter end to Grant's presidency. Though famed for the victory, Sitting Bull's Lakota Sioux Indians won over General George A. Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn in late June 1876, 
the war ultimately ended in victory for the federal government. The administration of Rutherford B. Hayes, who had succeeded Grant by the time the war ended, imposed a harsh peace settlement whereby the lands of the Sioux were annexed and the Plains Indians of the region were forced into Indian reservations, a depressing end to Grant's enlightened Indian policy. In many other ways, Grant was ahead of his time. For instance, in 1875, he proposed a constitutional amendment to fundamentally weaken the ability of religious groups and churches to dominate the educational curriculum in a given state or region. Essentially, here he was calling for greater separation of church and state in a manner which was only beginning to be countenanced in the more liberal European countries. Equally, he was progressive in his advocacy for America's Jews, appointing dozens of Jewish Americans to federal office. Perhaps most unusual was his appointment of Eli S. Parker, a Seneca Indian, as his commissioner for Indian affairs. Yet Grant's presidency was not without scandal either. During the 1872 election campaign, the press revealed that a number of prominent members of the Republican Party had been involved in siphoning profits from the Union Pacific Railroad Company through a shady corporate entity called Credit Mobilier. Grant, who it must be said was scrupulously honest throughout his military and political career, was not implicated directly, but the fallout nevertheless damaged the Republicans and by implication his presidency. Worse followed in 1875 with the so-called Whiskey Ring Scandal. This had involved prominent federal officials and whiskey distillers defrauding the government out of tax revenues, facilitated by a widespread system of bribery. Again, Grant was not involved, but his private secretary, Orville E. Babcock, was, as was the Secretary of War, William Belknap. Resignations followed. But Grant again was damaged in the final two years of his presidency by the actions of others. The final act of Grant's presidency became one of the most controversial moments in the constitutional and electoral history of the United States, though Grant acquitted himself well throughout the course of it. With Grant having served two terms, the Republican Party had selected Rutherford B. Hayes to contest the 1876 presidential election against the Democratic candidate Samuel Tilden. The election was held on the 7th of November, 1876. The result, when it came, was highly contentious. In the mid-1870s, there were 369 electoral college votes. When the votes were counted, it was clear that Tilden had won 184 votes one short of the 185 needed to be elected president. Hayes had certainly won 165 votes, but 20 votes were the subject of considerable dispute. These were the Electoral College votes for the states of Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Oregon. In the case of Oregon, the vote was contested as one of the electors for the state was found to be illegitimate as he was an appointed official there, while in the other three states, the vote was close enough that both parties claimed victory. The dispute dragged on into 1877. As it did, Grant, as the sitting president, came center stage. He instructed Congress to resolve the matter through legislative action and according to the electoral rules. He also refrained from mobilizing the army in the event of continuing disagreement and on the 29th of January 1877, he formed an electoral commission to decide on the matter. This eventually resulted in what was to become known as the Compromise of 1877. Under its terms, Rutherford B. Hayes was elected as the 19th President of the United States, a decision which was certainly fair, as the surviving evidence indicates that Hayes had actually won the four states in contention, though by less than a thousand votes in the cases of both Florida and South Carolina. As such, Hayes would enter the White House with the smallest winning margin in the US electoral history, winning the Electoral College vote by 185 votes to Tilden's 184 votes. But his victory came at a cost, in return for their acceptance of the result, the Democrats demanded that federal troops, which had been stationed across the former Confederacy states in the South since the end of the Civil War, should be removed from states such as Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. In the aftermath of their departure, 
the Democrats tightened their grip on the southern states, essentially rejecting Reconstruction and opting for a harsh imposition of Jim Crow laws, which disenfranchised the free African-American community in the south of the United States. Part of Grant's legacy has been tied up in his role in the Compromise of 1877 and the manner in which it allowed for the oppression of the African-American communities of the southern states for decades to come. Yet Grant can hardly be held accountable for this. The southern states always seemed likely to set out on the path which they did in 1877, and Grant can hardly have prevented this in his final days in office. Conversely, at the time, he was widely praised for the manner in which he averted a constitutional crisis and renewed violence across the United States through his handling of the election crisis. Once the compromise was reached and Hayes eventually took up office in early March 1877, Grant was once again a private citizen. He was still just 54 years of age, a markedly young age for a man who had served an eight-year term and who had already lived such an eventful life up to that point. Given this, his later years might seem like something of an anticlimax, but they were not without their own considerable points of interest. First up was a world tour which he and Julia undertook. Over a two and a half year period between the early summer of 1877 and the autumn of 1879, Europe was first on the itinerary with the Grants travelling to England to meet with Queen Victoria before a long sojourn through continental Europe, in which audiences were had with Pope Leo XIII and the Chancellor of the newly established German Empire, Otto von Bismarck. Others whom they met with included Napoleon III of France and the celebrated German composer Richard Wagner. Further travel was then undertaken to the Holy Land and Egypt before returning to Europe and then heading onwards to Asia in 1879. The last leg of the world tour was the most interesting in many respects. While visiting Meiji, Japan, Grant became involved in efforts to establish a lasting peace between Japan and Qing China, during the course of which he got caught up in a conspiracy which aimed to assassinate both the Emperor Meiji and Grant himself. The Grants finally returned to the US, arriving in San Francisco in September 1879. During their long circumnavigation of the globe, Grant had received petitions from members of the Republican Party asking him to run again for the presidential office. In the 19th century, and for much of the 20th century, until the passage of the 22nd Amendment to the US Constitution by Congress in 1947, there was no legal barrier to serving more than two terms in office. However, tradition dictated that no one typically should serve more than two terms, in line with a precedent which George Washington had established. Now, however, many believed that tradition should be ignored to bring Grant back for a third term. Grant was not indisposed to the scheme, and so encouraged his supporters to put forward his name at the Republican National Convention, which met at Chicago in early June 1880. What followed was a chaotic convention. Three main candidates, Grant, James Blaine, and John Sherman, were the candidates. Grant secured the most votes in the initial voting, but not enough to reach the 370 votes required for any candidate to be officially selected by the party. After dozens of subsequent votes, the impasse was finally broken when Blaine's supporters conceived of a scheme to nominate a compromise candidate in the shape of James Garfield, like Grant, a former Union general who had fought in the Civil War. Realizing he was beaten, Grant eventually threw his backing behind Garfield. The Republicans finally had a candidate, one who won the subsequent presidential election, but he did not last long in office as Garfield was assassinated in September 1881, just months after his inauguration, becoming the second of four US presidents to have been killed in office. His vice president, Chester A. Arthur, succeeded Garfield and served until 1885. In the aftermath of his world tour and his failed presidential bid, Grant returned to the world of business. This was a time when US presidents did not receive a pension after leaving office and Grant had never been an affluent man, nor had he ever been an astute businessman, and his post-presidential ventures proved no exception to this rule. 
Incredibly, the Grants had actually lost money on their world tour, where Grant could have capitalized on his renown to profit from it, and a venture into the railway sector in the early 1880s also proved unfruitful. Then, in 1883, Grant became involved in a Wall Street business venture which his son, Buck, had undertaken with Ferdinand Ward, a financier and a conman. In New York City, Ward was soon engaging in highly fraudulent activity, involving hundreds of thousands of dollars in what was effectively a pyramid scheme. As a silent partner, Grant was almost certainly oblivious to what was happening, but Buck Grant was quite possibly privy to Ward's actions. In any event, Grant himself testified against Ward in court in 1885, shortly before his own death. And when the full details emerged, it actually elicited public sympathy for Grant, who had been swindled considerably by Ward. While all of this was unfolding in New York, the former president was working away at what became the only truly profitable business venture of his entire life. A renowned storyteller, Grant decided in the early 1880s to write his memoirs. His financial situation was inestimably aided by an offer by Mark Twain to publish the memoirs and guarantee Grant 70% of the royalties, an enormous percentage which was a clear act of charity on Twain's part. Eventually finished in the early summer of 1885, the memoirs have been well regarded ever since, with Grant depicting himself fairly and accurately by most standards. They became a bestseller, and Julia Grant was able to live a comfortable later life from the proceeds of royalties, which nearly reached a half a million dollars in sales, a huge sum for the late 19th century. Yet Grant would never live to see his memoirs published. In the summer of 1884, he had developed a throat problem, which was subsequently diagnosed in October as throat cancer. It advanced rapidly, and Grant would ultimately die from it on the 23rd of July, 1885, just days after finishing his memoirs, and at the relatively young age of 63. Over one and a half million people attended Grant's funeral in a long 11-kilometer procession through New York City on the 8th of August 1885. In sharp contrast to later impressions of his presidency, Grant was eulogized at the time as being comparable to George Washington. He was buried in Riverside Park, but his body was later re-entombed at the purpose-built General Grant National Memorial in the Morningside Heights neighborhood of Upper Manhattan, where it remains the largest burial tomb dedicated to an individual in the entirety of North America. During the 20th century, Ulysses S. Grant suffered from a poor reputation as one of the worst presidents of the United States, a belief repeatedly reaffirmed in polls and surveys. Views on him have changed to some extent in the last 20 years, but even so, this slightly more positive view of the 18th president has only seen him jump up the rankings to be considered about the 25th best or so of the 46 US presidents. Yet what the foregoing has sought to highlight is that this historical impression is largely unfair. To be sure, Grant had his flaws, but both as a military commander and as US president after the American Civil War, he accomplished much during a very tumultuous and difficult period in the history of the United States. Grant's military record speaks for itself to a large extent. Early on, he gained some attention for his service during the US-Mexican War, but thereafter, owing to a number of personal motives, he drifted away from military service. The outbreak of the American Civil War, though, in 1861, brought him back into the field. In the early years of that conflict, he distinguished himself well enough to become one of the Union's senior commanders, and no one was as prominent as him in the final reduction of the Confederacy in 1864 and 1865. Many scholars have pointed to the overwhelmingly superior resources which Grant had at his disposal against Robert E. Lee in these closing stages of the war, and suggest that he could not really lose given these advantages. But several other Union generals had previously been given the same resources as Grant had in the last year or so of the war, and yet they had failed to defeat the Confederates. Conversely, Grant did and there is no doubting his significance to the annals of the American Civil War.
his post-war record as president is less well regarded than it might be. As the 18th President of the United States, he guided the country through the arduous early period of reconstruction and economic stabilization in the aftermath of the war. He was successful enough that he was easily re-elected for a second term in the election of 1872. Moreover, Grant succeeded in reducing the power of groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan, in the aftermath of the war, to a significant degree. Certainly, the Klan rose to become a very troubling aspect of American life again in future decades, but this was not Grant's fault. Furthermore, while his policies towards the Native Americans of the Plains ultimately ended in war in the mid-1870s, Grant's approach towards the Indians was relatively progressive for its time, and the Sioux War was as much the product of decades of Western expansionism as it was anything Grant did during his term in office. Finally, his role in resolving the crisis which ensued from the presidential election of 1876 needs to be considered and appreciated. Thus, we are left with a man who has been largely unfairly denigrated by subsequent generations. Grant was something of a contrarian, and certainly a heavy drinker throughout his life. But ultimately, he navigated many of the difficulties and challenges he encountered as well as he could. There are a great many of America's presidents who are generally more favorably regarded than Grant, who, if they had been placed in his shoes between 1869 and 1877, might not have kept the ship of state on such an even keel in the aftermath of the only civil war the country has ever experienced. That is to his credit. What do you think of Ulysses S. Grant? Should he be primarily remembered for his role as a general in the American Civil War? Or is his legacy as President of the United States one which has been unfairly dismissed and forgotten? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.